we only have to spend about a minute in the ocean to realise that it's not our home. That's about as long as most of us can hold our breath. We can put on a life jacket and float around on top of it and be safe enough, or we can put on a scuba tank and go down into the depth for maybe an hour or so. But even down there, we're so obviously clumsy compared to the creatures that actually dwell in the ocean. Largely to us, it's a mystery, which makes it a great metaphor for God, a great metaphor for life in the spirit. It was Isaac Newton who said that no matter what other people might think of him and his brilliance, he felt like a small child walking along the ocean shore, every now and then picking up a pebble and skimming it across the ocean surface, compared to that vast body of knowledge out there beyond him. Of course, he dabbled in theology as much as he dabbled in science, and so it was a metaphor not just for his scientific inquiry, but for his theological reflections as well. God is far beyond our understanding and certainly far beyond our control, and the ocean reminds us of that like no other place on earth. The Jewish people were scared of the oceans. It was a place of chaos, and so the creation story talks about the spirit hovering over the waters and bringing order to that chaos. They were also pretty scared of God at times, talking about the fear of God. And as Paul said, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Terrible as in terrifying. Both God and the ocean are at times overwhelming and quite scary. Of course, the ocean is also refreshing and calming. It gives us life and vigour. Australians in particular, for the most part, love hanging around the ocean. It's the place we go to relax. And the same with God. God is a source of peace and comfort, a source of refreshment, a source of fun and play, as well as a terrifying presence that we can never quite control. The oceans, of course, are far more than a metaphor for God. They exist in and of themselves and are good in and of themselves. They're a home for countless creatures, right down in the depths in places that we haven't yet visited even, as well as in the shallows. Our neighbours in the ocean need the ocean to continue to be able to support them. These creatures are good in and of themselves and have a right to exist in and of themselves. They also bring pleasure to God. They are part of the diversity of life. It's up to us to ensure that they are able to have the kind of life and the kind of relationship to God that God desires them to have, that they are able to be themselves and to live according to their way. The oceans, of course, provide a resource of food for a myriad of creatures as well, including human beings. How do we make decisions about what's a fair use of the ocean? about what's a fair share of the ocean's resources for humanity. Around the world, fish stocks have been in decline for decades and people seem very reluctant to reduce our fishing in response. Some stocks crash, that puts even more pressure on others. When humans argue about fishing quotas, the main criteria seem to be the livelihood of fishers at the moment, which is fair enough, and the price of fish that we're going to have to pay, which seems less fair. Occasionally, we'll talk about future generations of humans who are also going to need to be able to fish and make a livelihood. Almost never do we talk about the fish themselves and the other creatures that rely on them. And yet, we are called to be part of the reconciliation and renewal of the whole of creation, all of which God has declared good, and all of which needs to be enabled to survive now and into the future.